for lunch, and that will start at 12.45. Uh, so now for the first talk of this segment, we have Emma Delskull with Making Your Life API-er with Django. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm going to wait for the slides to come on. So yeah, that's great. He found a way to, to pronounce the title because I honestly had no idea how to pronounce it. It looks good written down, but I was not sure how to pronounce that. Okay, and full screen. This should be good. Okay, so making your life happier with Django. Uh, first of all, who am I? My name is Eva. I am a co-founder of a small Belgian company named Levit. Um, and yeah, I should. Is this better? Okay. Um, I've had the honor to be chosen as a DSF uh, individual member uh, not too long ago. I'm also the maintainer of these two projects, the Aero Schema Adapter that we're going to be talking about today and MBR CLI Quantities. So, making your life API-er, um, I guess you all know that we're going to be talking about APIs today. But uh, first of all, what is an API? So, according to uh, Wikipedia, this is what an API is. So, in short, um, it is a set of clearly defined methods of communication among various uh, components of a software. Uh, it, can mean, it, it can make development easier if it is well written, and it does not only apply to the web, although today we're mainly going to be talking about the web. So when we talk about the web and APIs, we talk about usually REST APIs, there is uh, recently things like GraphQL that have um, been introduced to the scene, but here we're here to talk about REST APIs with Django. And usually, what does a REST API with Django and Django REST framework look like? Looks like? Well, it's a set of views, um, one set for collections where you can get and post. So for example, here we have a endpoint for products. So slash API slash product, you can get do a, a get call on that and you will get a list of products. Or you can do a post call on that to create a new product. You also have a second view, which is the detail view, uh, similar to Django um, detail view for uh, just displaying web page. And on this detail view, so it's uh, slash API slash product slash the ID, and you usually have four methods on that. Get, that will give you the details of the product, all the information, but that is used to um, update the entire product, so the, all the fields of the products. Patch, which is used to update only certain fields of that item, or delete, which is uh, used to, be, to, to delete uh, the item. If you talk to people who um, like REST a lot and they want you to have what they call a RESTful API, they will also tell you that it's very important that your API is discoverable. We will come back to that uh, a bit later. So why do we need REST APIs as Django project? After all, what we want to do is display web page. We, we don't want the APIs. Well, you kind of do. Um, you sometimes want the APIs to add uh, advanced components on your page, or you want to make your data available to third-party applications. That's um, usually, that's been uh, for a long time the first reason why people made APIs for their uh, products for their website. Like, for example, if you have a weather website and you have a basic website where you can enter a city and the website will tell you the, the weather in your city, that's really nice. But if they have a, an API, if they have a, an API that's open, you can, what you can do is you can make requests to that API and, for example, add the local weather to your favorite shell and so you always, always know what weather it is, uh, it is outside without having to look through the window. This is, <laughs> well, people are laughing, but I know people who have done that. Um, 
But more recently, uh, there's been other uses for uh, APIs. Um, mobile devices have made APIs um, much more popular and needed because uh, whether you have an Android or uh, you have an, an iPhone, these are two completely separate clients, two different clients that need to interact with the same. I lost. That need to interact with the same set of data and be able to retrieve the same data, update the same data, and so if you have a nice API, you will be able to use the same API with both clients. Uh, something that is also fairly new uh, is uh, web frontends, uh, JavaScript um, frameworks or libraries like React, Vue, Ember, uh, and those are also making use of APIs. And also, we want to use APIs and this client-server interaction because we know it works. We've been using that for years. Uh, somebody else, unfortunately, I don't remember the name, but in another conference said that um, working with uh, computers and programming is, is a bit like a pendulum. Uh, at some point at the, in the 70s, we had mainframe, like the IBM AS400, and uh, you had one mainframe, one big computer on the, uh, on the premises, and everybody would have terminals, would have uh, 10 clients, with which they would connect to the, to the server, and then we, we kind of went uh, the other way, and everybody had a desktop computer, and you're hanging in the middle, and we're going to, to maybe find some balance. Um, but yeah, so API with Django. So when you, we talk about API with Django, uh, we usually talk about Django REST framework. Django REST framework is um, a special place uh, in the uh, Django ecosystem because it is one of the only um, applications that is recognized, that is um, uh, recognized by the core team as being part of Django, even if uh, slightly outside. Um, and right now, w most people would not think about using something else, but in the beginning, there was also TastyPy. So uh, I don't know how many of you know about TastyPy. Uh, a few hands, yeah. Um, so TastyPy uh, used to be uh, in concurrence with uh, Django REST framework. It is built differently. It's built um, similarly to some uh, REST APIs for other frameworks like uh, Rails. And um, one of the reasons that it might have been popular at some point that is that it was um, easy to prototype things with. Uh, it required less code, and it was faster to, to prototype things. So what does the code for an API with Django REST framework look like? Um, it looks like this. Um, so for starters, you usually, don't skip to the next slide, uh, you usually have, uh, for each model, you usually have to uh, create a serializer and tell, uh, tell it what model you're serializing, what fields you have, this is the minimal information. You also need a view set. Well, well, you don't need a view set. This is a way to do it. You could have a, a set of different distinct views, but one way to do it, the minimal way, is to have a view set and provide that view set with a query set and a serializer. And then uh, you are left with uh, registering that uh, view set in the URLs. Um, if we want to, just uh, for information's sake, compare to uh, what you would have been doing with uh, TestyPy, with TestyPy, you would just have had to declare a resource per model and then register that resource in the URLs. Um, it's less code, but it's also sometimes perceived as a bit more magic and less flexible. But yeah, I love um, Django REST framework, but one day uh, I found myself in the position of having to write a new application. This application has about 50 models that I took the time to write and to prepare. And um, we needed to create an API because this was an API-based application. 
And I really didn't want to write 50 serializers, 50 view sets, 50 URLs. I'm, I'm a bit lazy that way, so I started thinking, well, what if I could do that with a, what if I could just get away with Django admin? I mean, with Django admin, you want to create an admin for a model. All you have to do is to register the, that model. You can do uh, either you can create a class with a um, decorator, or you can uh, just register directly the model. Just don't say anything. This is the minimal thing to do. One of the great things about the admin is that I don't have to create a, a different URL for each model that I want to expose. I just need to expose the URL for the admin and everything is done. And if I'm really being really, really lazy, I could just import the, the models module from my application and just uh, loop through all the, the things it exposes, look if it's a model and just register that and, and don't do anything else. That's, that's three lines of code. I, I would, I would be really happy to, to, to be able to, to do that. And so this is how the Aero Schema Adapter uh, started. The ideas for uh, the Aero Schema Adapter started. I wanted to be able to uh, register to create some APIs as fast as I would have been able to create some admins. And so this is the code that you would need to write to uh, create a uh, Django REST Framework API with the R Schema Adapter. This uh, works uh, very similarly to the admin, as you can register a model either by using a decorator or on a special class, or you can just register a model directly on the, the router, and you just need to add uh, this router once in the URLs, and then you have a fully working basic API that will do CRUD for all those models no customizations, all fields are exposed, everything is writable. This is not what you want for production, uh, for, for production application, but it can get you started really quickly. Now, of course, fast prototyping is nice, but you need to be able to customize that. This was uh, one of the problems I, I went, mentioned with, with Testify. Apparently, people were not seeing clearly how the how to customize their thing. It was easier to do with uh, Django REST framework. But so here was um, the endpoint class that I've been using to, to register my, my endpoints. I can do some customizations too. And that customization looks a lot like what it would be uh, looking with an admin class. So we're familiar with that. It also uses the same terms as, um, the, as Django REST framework uses in some of its classes. Um, but yes, what this endpoint class, it's, it's not just that, it also hides uh, some factories. So um, what, what you can do is, because when you look at, at a serializer, for example, when you want to write a Django REST framework serializer, the first thing you have to say is, hey, this is a serializer for that model, I want to expose those fields. And you have those details that are a bit uh, redundant sometimes, that can feel a bit redundant, and that could be replaced by a factory. Um, so for example, here to create a nested serializer, I'm using a serializer factory that just takes the models uh, and um, the, the main serializer does not have this information of what model it is for, um, what field it exposes, because this is, this factory is going to be fed into my endpoint class. Um, I think I skipped a slide. Uh, yeah, here in my product endpoint, I've got a base serializer. This is going to be uh, fed into a factory that's going to fill in everything that I did not bother to fill in myself. Um, so this, um, this endpoint class is, is, not, is not really magic. Um, it's just a wrapper around a Django REST framework and a series of factories, and those factories do very basic things, like filling in the blanks that I was too lazy to fill in myself. Um, there is this base serializer. There is also a base view set that you can uh, provide to the endpoint classes. And base view sets are um, 
work with the same principle as base serializers. Those are view sets that I wanted to customize. I wanted to customize uh, methods on the view set. I wanted to do uh, something special, but I didn't want to bother to filling the information that I thought were obvious, like uh, the query set or the serializer I was going to be using. Um, and also, um, fast prototyping, uh, for fast prototyping, I was really um, uh, looking forward to not having to write one URL per model that I wanted to expose because I still had those 50 models to, that I wanted to expose. So I wanted to have something where I could just stick one URL for, the, for my API and then everything else would be uh, done automatically for me. So uh, since the admin was already doing that, I decided that I wanted to do the same as the admin and use uh, the, auto the Django auto discovery um, processes. So if you create in your application an endpoints.py file, uh, it will be automatically loaded and uh, register all your uh, endpoints um, just uh, as you would if you created an admin.py file and every admin class that is in there is going to get automatically added to your admin. But remember, we talked earlier about discoverability. Thus, what, what were we trying to do when, when I was creating this application? The, this API-based application, the idea was to have a thin client that didn't know anything about my application, just knew how to log in and to access the API. Um, and I wanted this client to be able to do everything, so my API needed to be discoverable. And um, so I, I was, I needed to be able to, to expose some, uh, some more information. Um, and one way, usually when people talk about discoverability for an API, what, what the, the kind of things that they're expecting to see is this. If you look here and you see for the category field, uh, we don't have just an ID, we have a full URL to be able to um, access the API for that category. And uh, if we click on that, well, we will see um, the JSON for the, the category that this product belongs to, which is nice. It's very readable for humans. Now, on the other side of the screen, you have another ex example, which is a too many relationship. It could be one too many, many too many, it doesn't matter. And we see here that we're starting to, to have a bit of a problem. It's starting to be quite verbose because we have these five links to products. The links are basically the same. It's just one thing that changes, it's the ID. So maybe we could have something different like um, having some information about that field that the, ad the address for this API is uh, slash API v1 slash category slash products and then just have the ID, which you can have uh, in uh, your Django REST framework API if you just uh, choose a regular uh, relationship field and not a hyperlink relationship field. And this kind of information, there's already a, already a place to get it. In Django REST framework, there is this thing that's called a metadata class. And the metadata class is what, um, what writes the information that you will see when you do an options call to your uh, endpoint, uh, to, to the base URL of your endpoint. So here, this is the, the information we get for the products. And as you can see, we have some names, uh, description, what it uh, accepts, what it births. We also have at the bottom of the screen a list of actions. And for each of those actions, we have a list of fields that didn't fit on the screen. But the field I wanted to show is this one. Uh, this one, I wanted to show this field to you because um, unfortunately, I don't find that really useful. Uh, this uh, tells me that my field is the field for category that is of type field. Wow, this is a surprise. It's it's, it's a field, okay? And well, at least I know that it's required that it's not read only and I have the label, but I don't really have 
much useful information. What, what is this field? What does it represent? Can I, can I put some string in there? Can, should I put some integer? What, what is it? Um, so I wanted to, to do more. I wanted to expose more data. So I uh, started writing something else. And right about now, I have to make this disclaimer. My personal framework, front-end framework of choice is Ember. So there are going to be some mentions of Ember.js in the next few slides. If you don't like Ember, it's OK. What I'm going to say is uh, valid for any other framework. It's just that I have concrete examples uh, with Ember and not with uh, other frameworks. Uh, so. Um, as I was saying, I wanted to write to create some, some metadata, and I wanted to be able to expose some different data in different circumstances. So uh, DR Schema Adapter uh, provides uh, this thing that is a metadata class. And this metadata class uh, can uh, use different adapters. And you can have a default adapter, but from the command line or from different URLs or things, you can decide to uh, expose different types of the metadata at the same time. So for example, you could be exposing some metadata for an Ember application, but you could also be, at the same time with a different URL, be exposing some metadata for a React application. And um, so since um, this data here is some uh, metadata for Ember, which is a full MVC framework, so it has this notion of models and foreign keys and relationship. Um, I can uh, provide this data and I can say, hey, this is not just a field. The widget for this field should be a foreign key. I also have the extra information of this related model uh, and the name of the model. So by putting the base API address plus the name of the model together, Amber is going to be able to get a list of categories. So if I want to, uh, for example, provide a dropdown of categories, the front-end application would know where to get the list of categories it needs to populate the dropdown. Um, since um, it also knows that it's a foreign key, when it's going to get the JSON with the data for that record, it's going to see that the category ID is one, and so it knows that in that dropdown, the category to be selected is the one with ID one. Um, so, once again, back to the reason I started this application, Terra Schema Adapter, is that I wanted an API-based application. So, exposing models uh, with CRUD functionalities is great, but that's not an application. Usually, you need to do something else. For example, if you have an invoice, you want uh, in the list of invoice, you might want to have a button next to an invoice to be able to download a PDF for that invoice. Or you want to have another um, button next to on that line that you can click and say, hey, my customer paid that invoice. Please mark it as paid. And so um, we need some, some way to expose that. And as we have seen uh, on uh, the previous screen, uh, the default metadata for uh, Django REST frameworks already, already tells you about some actions. But it only gives you the actions for the current URL that you are using. Um, no, there's only a limited set of methods that you can do on, on a URL. You can do options, get, post, put, patch. Uh, if, if I have five different things, uh, first of all, I don't have enough methods. And second of all, it would not be a great uh, way to just do a, a, a different method to print an invoice. I would like to have a specific URL to, to print that invoice. But then this is not discoverable in the uh, basic metadata. So I need some other way to expose that. So uh, once again, Using uh, the DRS uh, schema adapter metadata class and uh, your adapter of choice, you can decide to expose some more methods. And how do you uh, tell uh, Django REST framework and DRS schema adapter that those methods need to be exposed? Well, there are two ways to do that. You can either just uh, pass it a dictionary with uh, the available actions 
and all the information you want to uh, give about those actions, or you can use some decorators on some of the methods that you will be writing either on the endpoint or on the view set. And for example, here we have a pay method that is decorated. I am sorry about the color, this, uh, this gray, uh, it might not be readable for everybody, but there is a decorator on top of the, of the method that just says, hey, this is a custom action, uh, here is the text I want it um, to use, and uh, here is the, um, the method, it, it needs to use the method as in post, and um, so there are schema adapters going to be looking through all your endpoints and looking for those decorators and saying, oh, Here's the collections of actions that you can do uh, for these uh, invoices. And so it's going to provide a list of available actions so your clients can, for example, put a series of buttons next to each invoice. Um, of course, as I, as I said, this is something that, this is an adapter that has been built for Ember. Uh, there are some other default adapters. I'm going to start by talking about the JSON API adapter. If you've never heard of it, JSON API is this thing that seems to be great. It does exactly what I want. It is, uh, um, and uh, it's not JSON API, it's JSON schema. JSON API is something totally different, I'm sorry. So JSON schema um, is this thing great. That's supposed to be uh, um, a way to describe fields. Uh, and there are a lot of libraries that claim to be using uh, JSON schema. Unfortunately, JSON schema is uh, really small by itself, and it doesn't uh, have things like foreign keys and things like that. So a lot of libraries that claim to be using JSON schema use JSON schema as a base, but they all extend it with their own extension, and all the extensions are different and usually not compatible. Uh, so this is why there is an adapter for uh, basic uh, JSON schema, but there's also another adapter that is provided that is for uh, some uh, React uh, JSON schema because there is a library in React that uses JSON schema which is not the basic JSON schema, it expects some other data. Uh, we also have uh, an adapter for Angular and the Formly, um, the Formly library that allows you to build forms. Uh, we, of course, have a number adapter, which is the most uh, fully fledged adapter that takes all the information that is available from your endpoints, from your view set serializers, all the fields, all the actions that are possible. It can do lists, it can do forms, it can do uh, actions, uh, wizards, everything. Um, but this is, if you are not using Amber, this is probably not what you want. So you can also uh, build your own adapters and decide what information you want to provide and how you want to provide it. There is a base adapter that you can extend and you can uh, select the, everything that you want to expose or, and how you want to expose it. Um, but yes. Since I opened the Pandora box and started talking about Amber, um, there are other things that could be useful for my front-end application. Um, and this is valid for Amber. This is valid if you're do doing a GTK client. It is valid for something. So Amber is a, a full MVC framework, so it has this notion of model. A model for my client what is the model for my client? It's not going to connect directly to a database, it's going to connect to an API. So the model for my client is a mirror of the serializer for my endpoint. It just says the list of fields for which kind of models. So this is something that I already know, we already know on our backend. So this is also something, this is the second part of the RS schema adapter. There's an exporter application that can be used to export uh, some information. So in this case, it is exporting a very ugly uh, JS uh, model for um, for uh, uh, this is for segment for serum segment. It is uh, exporting uh, some information, and I'm going to skip because. Um, 
I am running late, and so I will not have time for questions. And so this is, for example, an example of a form that can be completely rendered just by extracting information from an API. The front end that is rendering this application has absolutely no information about the back end. It knows how to log in and how to get the information from the API, and it is able to render this complex form just with that information. Uh, since I'm running a bit over time, uh, if you have some more questions and you want some more information, feel free to find me in the hallways or come find me at the sprints. And I will be publishing the link to the um, to these slides with uh, the links at the end to the library and some examples. Thank you. Thank you, Emma, for the great talk.